Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome uh, to this public meeting of the Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul Council. I would be grateful if you could please turn your mobile phones off or switch to the silent setting during the meeting. Thank you. It is important that everyone present. It is important that everyone present is aware of the evacuation procedures. On hearing the evacuation alarm bell, which will have a constant ring, you should leave the meeting room at once by way of the nearest signed fire exit route and locate at the front of the town hall. Members of the public and press are permitted to record or film the proceedings this evening. Those that do are asked not to film in the public gallery and that the chairman has the discretion to terminate any recording if continuing to do so will pre prejudice the meeting. Item one on this evening's agenda, apologies for absence. Chief Executive. Thank you, Chairman. We've had uh, apologies received from Be Councillor Beverly Dunlop, <coughs> Councillor Mike Cox, Councillor Mike Green, sorry, Councillor Lisa Northover, Councillor Susan Phillips and Councillor Anne Stripley. Yes, thank you. I have apologies from Councillor Chris Matthews. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, uh, declarations of interests. Do we have any uh, declarations of interests? Uh, uh, none, none received, Chairman. Thank you. Item three, confirmation of minutes. Are members happy that... Uh, for me to sign as a true and correct record the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. No. Councillor Butt. Laura. Is that Sorry. Um, you have uh, the correction that was made last time is still not correct on um, item um, uh, 15A. Uh, sorry. The vote that was taken before, um, it should have been Clause 15A, and I voted against. I didn't abstain. So that's on Section 19, Item 19. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, we'll ensure that that's amended accordingly. And apologies. Uh, thank you. Item 5, public issues. Uh, I believe we have a couple of questions this evening. Oh, oh beg your pardon. Beg your pardon, members. I've skipped to item 5 instead of item 4. Members, it's with great regret that I have to refer to the recent death of Sir George Merrick, who is a major landover, landowner in the area, and I know he, uh, he was very much involved in uh, community affairs, not only just in Bournemouth, uh, but in Burton, um, uh, where he was uh, much appreciated in his contributions towards the, the parish council and the things that they did. Um, I also have to report that... Uh, the recent death of former borough of Paul Councillor Ray Smith, who was a Camford Cliffs Councillor from May 1995 to May 2007. Ray was Sheriff in 2002-2003, Mayor in 2003-2004, and Deputy Mayor in 2004-2005. He served on numerous committees, including as Chairman of the Planning Committee and Vice Chairman of the Community Support and Education Scrutiny Committee. In addition, he served as a council representative on various outside bodies and was the Carers' Champion in 2006-2007. And I understand that Councillor May Haynes would just like to say a few words. Councillor Haynes. 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, originally, Councillor Ms. Stribley was going to pay the tribute, but she's unwell, so she has asked me to pay tribute on her behalf. Councillor Ray Smith, MBE, a name with which a great deal would mean a great deal to all who knew this very modest but larger-than-life character. Ray started from very humble beginnings, a Londoner helping family as a barrel boy, a lad, helping at the haulage firm where his father was a lorry driver. After leaving school, getting a job with that firm in their offices and rapidly rising to become a manager. From his early days, Ray understood the concepts of total honesty, hard work, doing the best he possibly could and earning his way in life. Of course, Ray was also lucky enough to recognize a good thing and an opportunity when it faced him. His first and lasting bit of luck was when he met Jean, who not only understood but appreciated the man that he was and would become. They married in 1956. Together, Ray and Jean worked hard, eventually together setting up a retail business and then branching out into the travel market when package holidays first became popular. I mention this because whilst visiting Africa to find venues for their package holidays, Ray asked the locals if improving their economy was top of their wish list. He was firmly told no. Outside the resorts, what's needed most of all is clean water. Ray considered what he might be able to do to help. On his return to the UK, he badgered the Secretary of State, the Prime Minister, the American Ambassador, and the President of the USA about the matter. And soon the international charity, Water Aid, came into existence because of the dogged determination of one Ray Smith. After many successful years in business, Ray and Jean retired to Poole, as Ray had promised they would, However, Ray was not one for retiring and he still needed to feel active and useful. So, in 1993, he became a Dorset County Councillor, a role which he reveled in, but still found insufficiently challenging. So, in 1995, Ray stood for election again and became a Poole Borough Councillor for Canford Cliffs Ward, a position he proudly held until deciding to stand down in May 2007. Um, from 2002 to May 2005, Ray, more than ably assisted by wife Jean, went through the civic offices of sheriff, mayor and deputy mayor. A force to be reckoned with, Ray raised a phenomenal amount of money for his mayor's charity, which he spent on the young carers of Poole. These were a group of young people, usually well under the radar, who selflessly cared for a parent or sibling, as well as attempting to keep up with their studies. Ray had noticed them, wanted to do something practical to help, and so officially set up Poole's Poole's Young Carers Charity. He made sure that these youngsters had time out for themselves, be it a day out at Polton Park, a trip to Swanage, an evening disco, or whatever else they felt like doing or needed. In acknowledging this important work, Pool Council nominated Ray Smith as its official carer's champion in 2007, regardless of the fact that Ray had retired as a councillor. His caring for disadvantaged young people was work he joyously carried on throughout his retirement, work which was nationally recognized with the award of an MBE, an honor of which he was immensely proud. After a long struggle with illness, Ray sadly died on the 19th of September this year. For those who knew Ray, knowing him was an honor and a true pleasure. For those who did not know him personally, his life should be an inspiration. Rest in peace, Ray Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haynes. Would members please be upstanding in a silent tribute to uh, Councillor Smith?
Thank you, members. Members, I would like to give notice uh, of the following urgent items that the Council is asked to consider this evening. One, the potential deferral of the Council meeting on the 17th, 17th of December 2019. The adoption of the Boscombe and Pokesdown Neighbourhood Plan. A copy of the report has been circulated uh, in the Chamber this evening. Calendar of meetings for uh, the year 2020-21 seeking approval for delegated authority to be given to the Chief Executive in consultation with the Chairman of the Council, Cabinet and relevant committees to agree the calendar of meetings for 2020-2021. I propose to raise uh, the above items uh, following item 11 on this evening's agenda and the reason for the above urgent items is due to the general election and the requirement to comply with statutory deadlines. Item 5, public questions. Uh, we have two public questions, I believe, this evening, and the first one is Mr Simon Grimstone. Good evening, councillors, uh, council leader, and chairman. <clears throat> uh, my name is Simon Grimston. Um, I live in the West Hill area, so that's the BH2 postcode, so quite central to town. Um, my question is that um, the West Hill project and community have been working together since I set it up about three months ago. Uh, we have had some successes uh, in the tackling of criminal and antisocial behaviour. This is only the tip of the iceberg, and we have some way to go on this. <clears throat> Our efforts are directed in the following ways. The uh, protection of the environment, the um, increased well-being of our community, inclusive of those with disabilities, uh, or the victims of antisocial behaviour or crime. Uh, we're seeking um, sustainability in terms of resources, um, whether that be voluntary or financial uh, or advisory. <clears throat> There is a high risk that if funding does not continue, all those benefits that we have got together will be lost. Will the leader of the council therefore give the West Hill project a commitment to continued and sustainable funding? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimstone. Uh, could I call upon uh, the leader, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Grimstone, for your question, and thank you for inviting me to spend a morning with you so I could learn more about the issues faced by the area and so I could get to speak to business owners and residents like you about some of the social problems that they face. As you know, I've had several meetings with officers since we spent that time together, and I was delighted to have been asked to present an award to the team responsible for the community garden that has sparked some well-needed good news for the area. As you know, the West Hill Project is a two-year project funded by MHCLG and is a multi-agency effort driven by the Council to promote landlord and tenant rights, improve community cohesion and tackle issues relating to housing standards. Over the life of the project, a dedicated team of officers have already developed ex excellent relationships with the community who are now responding really positively and engaging more than ever before. As a result, we are now working with the community to better understand their experiences and have reviewed the project outcomes to make sure that we're not only delivering against our commitments, but to make sure that we are extending to additional resources that come with it. I'm pleased to announce that we have secured um, funding to continue the project until at least January 2021, and we'll soon be recruiting an additional member of staff to be able to work directly alongside the police and community to bring a focused approach to tackling antisocial behaviour and other community issues. We are also currently working with the police to review our collective understanding of the challenges that they face, and we'll be agreeing tactical responses shortly. We recognise there are still issues to deal with in the West Hill area and we will be doing our best to tackle them together. I'm pleased to report that 276 inspections have now taken place since the commencement of the project of, on uh, housing units, many of which have included multi-agency partners and have identified a range of issues to be addressed. 
The outcomes range from action to resolve housing standards issues and direct action on social anti-social behaviour and immigration. And the project also includes dedicated outreach with citizens' advice. The long-term future of the work in West Hill will largely be determined by the consultation that we are launching in January 2020 around discretionary licensing, as this area is included in the proposed area for designation. And we hope that that will go some way to improving the longer-term outcomes for the area. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Mr. Grimson. Uh, the second uh, public question this evening, um, Mr. Philip Stanley Watts uh, has a question addressing the problem of sand on the promenade between Bournemouth and Paul. Mr. Stanley Watts. Thank you, Chairman. Could the Cabinet member explain to me how he is addressing the problem of sand on the promenade, which is making Bournemouth and Paul seafront dangerous for de pedestrians, especially the disabled? This has been going on for three months, and with gale force winds, um, usually one day, it's understandable, but as a carer of wheelchair users, it's unacceptable there's a lack of disabled access through the build-up of sand over many weeks. Thank you, Mr. Stanley Watts. Uh, Councillor Allison, please. Thank you very much for the question. Um, the Seafront team have an ongoing battle to deal with windblown sand and remove over half a million tonnes of sand from the promenade every year. Um, the team are equipped with tractors and other specialised equipment and commit to providing an accessible route along the promenade within 24 hours of a major storm. And the staff members on the Seafront work incredibly hard to make sure that the promenade is as clear from sand as possible um, throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Thank you, Councillor Mr. Stanley Watts. The second item on uh, item five uh, statements. Councillor Susan Chapman has a statement that she wishes to make on coastal flooding and govern governance arrangements. Ms. Chapman, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Interactive global map coastalclimatecentral.org shows frightening sea level rise and coastal flood risk by 2050 affecting many areas including BCP. Brilliant engineer Paul Ambrose warned Bournemouth to over-engineer the town and throw away the anachronistic 1960s handbooks. Sadly, the pre-May administration curtailed democracy, the public's five-minute deputations and right to ask three questions per meeting. Moreover, a good week's notice was needed for any question today. And where is the flood advisory group? Yet all hands should be helping salvage Mother Nature on the climate emergency deck as humanity tries to avoid triggering irreversible breakdown. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Members, the second statement this evening is from Sarah Ward, uh, which is to make a statement regarding homelessness. Ms. Ward? Oh, OK, thanks. Following my recent Freedom of Information request, BCP Council have revealed that the Street Outreach Team are currently working with 319 individuals across Bournemouth and Poole. Freedom of Information requests also state that there are 193 homeless families living in temporary accommodation across BCP, including 273 children. It is clear that BCP has a housing crisis that needs urgent attention. I ask that the Unity Alliance convene an urgent multi-agency task force to establish a homelessness action plan that implements measures to tackle the unfolding situation. With over 700 homeless people dying in the UK last year, lives are literally at stake and a crisis response is clearly overdue. 
Thank you, Miss Ward. Members, the next item on the agenda is petitions, uh, and there are no petitions uh, for this meeting. We move on then to item six. Are members happy to uh, receive the minutes as set out at 6A to M this evening? <laughs> Councillor Butler, please. I've got a couple of corrections to make. Um, um, item J, Planning Committee, 3rd of October. Um, you have two items that have got the same reference number. Um, so hold on a minute. The Thorncombe Close um, um, application should be a double P nineteen double zero eight two one. Sorry, it's quoted as zero zero eight two one stroke F. Uh, and Cam Councillor Butler, sorry to uh, sorry. intervene, but uh, we'll we'll note what you say. Yeah, it, I, I've, I've been told that it has to go back to the planning committee for them to make the, uh, the oh. amendment. Okay. Okay. So that that's the one that's wrong anyway. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Thank you. So members, we are looking at. Um, a to M minus J, which would then be referred back to the planning committee. Are members happy? Great. Thank you. Moving on then to item seven, uh, recommendations arising from the cabinet and uh, other committees. Seven A, minute number. 39, the BCP Council investment to support the One Dorset Pathology Unit. Councillor Brown, I understand that you will move this recommendation and I call on Councillor Dedman to uh, second. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, present this report. The report presents the Council with the opportunity to support one of its key strategic partners in delivering a new modern pathology facility to serve both the conurbation and the rest of Dorset. The support will be in the form of a £14.9 million investment from the Council into Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch NHS Foundation Trust, which will be repaid evenly in equal instalments of capital of just under £1 million per annum. To make the investment, the Council needs to add on an exceptional basis the Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch Hospital to its list of approved counterparties and extend the normal five-year period for investments. This repayment will be made by the Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch NHS Foundation Trust regardless of the operational performance of the new one dorset pathology unit. The risk around delivering the savings from the new pathology unit will therefore lay with the Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch NHS Foundation Trust. This arrangement recognises that there is a limited amount of capital funding available within the NHS compared to the size of their revenue budget. And it's good news that it will, it will help the sort of health and well-being of people right across Dorset and help medical outcomes if this investment can go forward. Um, it's already been before the Overview and Scrutiny Board and before Cabinet and before the Audit and Governance Committee, and they've all supported it. So therefore, I'd like to move the recommendations. I won't read them through. They're all in front of you there. So I'd like to move those recommendations as listed in the paper. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Dedman. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Very happy to second this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dedman. And it's been uh, proposed and seconded. Do we have any uh, speakers at all on this item? No, in which case I'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Thank you very much. Carried. Beg your pardon. Item 7B, minute 69, Pool Bay Beach Management Scheme. Councillor Rice, I understand that you will move this recommendation and uh, Councillor Hadley will uh, second. Councillor Rice. Thank you very much. Um, so the Pool Bay Beach Management Scheme. 
is a project to provide coast protection to the coastal frontages of Poole and Bournemouth from Hengisbury Head in the east to the Sandbanks Peninsula in the west. Without the continuation of coast protection works over the next 100 years, significant numbers of residential and commercial properties would be lost to erosion along with highways and supporting infrastructure. The potential adverse impact to the tourism economy and amenity benefit would be of a scale of local, regional and national importance. The overall programme of works is being delivered in distinct phases um, which started in 2015 and go on to, to um, 2040 with the total, cost, total project cost estimated to be in the region of £50 million. Pounds. Funding of the project will include flood defence grant in aid and a proportion through partnership funding from the Council. The scheme commenced in 2015 with Phase 1, being successfully led and delivered by Bournemouth Borough Council. This was funded through a project appraisal report as an outline business case subsequently approved by the Environment Agency for Phase 1 of the project. Council has now asked um, to, for the recommendations to be passed that the Council, as the Coast Protection Authority, submits to the Environment Agency the outline business case for funding approval for the next section for the Coast Protection Works identified under Phase 2 and 3 combined um, and provided the application for flood defence grant in aid is successful for £3.3 million pounds to be funded in conjunction with the Environment Agency's Forward Capital Programme from Council Resources. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Hadley. Thank you. I'm happy to second this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Members, it's been proposed and seconded. Do we have any debate on this item? In which case, then I'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Any abstentions? Councillor Butler. Thank you, members. Moving on then to uh, minute 71. Uh, community Governance Review. Uh, Councillor Allison, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this report, uh, sorry, this report follows a previous report that's gone to Cabinet regarding the Community Governance Review for Thrupe and Holdenhurst. Um, following a successful p uh, petition to the Council, um, a task and finish group was set up, um, which was led by uh, Councillor Brooks, and this has since come back with its recommendations, which are listed in the report in front of you. So I'd, with that, I'd like to move those recommendations, and also to give my specific thanks to Councillor Brooks for his work in chairing that task and finish group. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, I'd just like to second this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the item has been... Uh, Proposed and seconded. Any debate? In which case we'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Abstentions? Thank you, members. Moving on then to minute number 74. Uh, BCP's Council's Corporate Strategy, Councillor Slade, I understand that you will move the recommendation. Thank you very much, Thank Chair. You. Um, I will note that uh, the copy of the cor revised Corporate Strategy is included in the papers. There isn't an attached report, um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure why there isn't an actual covering report, but... Uh, I'm very happy to, to move this. It's obviously been through quite a long process over the summer with uh, public uh, public engagement, business engagement, member engagement. Uh, went through ONS, uh, where I think it was described as a love-in, which was uh, first, probably the first and last time we'll have a love-in described at ONS. Um, then went on to Cabinet, where uh, a couple of minor changes were made to... Um, 
particularly the description of rather than a climate emergency, the climate and ecological emergency. But apart from that, um, it has gone through uh, so far very well, and it would be fantastic if we could adopt this um, unanimously and use this as the springboard for our delivery plan uh, for the future work of the council. So I uh, commend this to the council. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Howe. Uh, thank you. I'd like to second this. I'd just like to actually thank the senior officers who are involved in preparing this report. Uh, right from the start, they were very keen to get the strategy in place, and I think that bodes well for um, the, the Council in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Uh, it's been proposed and seconded. Is there any debate? Councillor <clears throat> Thank you. Just, just uh, only a comment. I think, I think actually, clearly, some feedback has gone into this, and just, um, it, I think it's looking very good. Um, I, oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, I probably wince that the word vibrant has stayed in there in vibrant communities, but so be it. Um, I'm struck by, maybe I didn't notice this before, the word outstanding quality of life. You set an extremely high bar there. If words mean something, and hopefully they do mean something in this, the word outstanding is something that's quite a hard target to live up to. And then the next stage from this is the uh, implementation plan with the steps, the milestones, and actually the outcomes involved in this for, to fulfil that. I think I think actually it, 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 it's, it's an overly high bar that's been set here, but very much look forward to seeing the follow through on this. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Inigar. Any other members wish to speak on this item? In which case, uh, it's been proposed and seconded. I'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? And any abstentions? Thank you, members. Members, moving on to uh, item eight on this evening's agenda, um, I, I would like to propose that this item be deferred uh, until the next meeting of the Council. I understand that uh, um, the, the various parties wish to discuss um, out of the, uh, the Chamber the requirements that uh, each, uh, each would like to uh, move forward with. So if members are happy, I'll defer this. Although, can I have a show of hands, please? <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Item 9 on this evening's agenda, members, review of the political... No, that's not... That's not... Is it? Sorry. The polling districts. I beg your pardon. Review of the polling districts and polling places. Uh, Councillor Slade, I understand you wish to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so before us we have the results of the um, review of the polling districts that uh, lots of residents very kindly gave us their thoughts on some of the changes to polling uh, stations last time and some tweaks to some of the polling place boundaries. Can I just get clarification that these come into effect immediately that we vote on them because I think it might affect people's place of polling for the next election or not? Are they for local? Uh, monitoring officer, please. But just to confirm, these changes um, won't apply to the general election that takes place on the 12th. Thank you for that. Um, in which case, that part of it is, is irrelevant. But what is important to state is that although the recommendations do talk about some changes to polling districts for the purposes of um, the local elections, I have had clarification that some of the recommendations around um, different polling stations may apply. The reason that they're not listed in the recommendations is because polling stations are always subject to availability. So while they might well be the first port of call for our choice of polling stations for a particular district, um, it's not appropriate for, appropriate for us to put them in the recommendations as they may or may not be available at the time of a future election. So just to clarify on that, but I would um, commend this report. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Councillor Howell. 
Yes, I'm happy to second this. Members, it's been proposed and seconded. Do we have any debate? No, thank you. In which case, then, we move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Those against? And any abstentions? Thank you, members. Uh, agenda item 10, Independent Remuneration Panel. Leader. Me again. Um, so this is just the, uh, we agreed to bring back uh, within the first 12 months of council a, a review of the uh, council scheme of allowances. Uh, under shadow council there were some queries and questions and some people disagreed with some of the schemes for uh, some particular committee uh, chairs. Um, I would encourage people that, uh, to support this so that we can get the independent review panel back to uh, review where we are, make any tweaks that are required. I was one of the councillors uh, who had an in-depth interview, um, there were others in the room, for the previous scheme of allowances, and I would encourage anyone who is approached by the independent panel to um, speak freely about what they think about our allowances, because uh, they, they were very good in taking those thoughts into account, um, and it's important that we get the, uh, get the job right, so I'd commend this paper. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Brown. Yeah, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Members, it's been proposed and seconded. Do I have any debate? In which case, can we move to the vote, please? All those in favour, please show. And just to check, those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. Item 11, the appointment of a new <coughs> Director of Public Health. Leader, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, this uh, paper, we have to formally um, appoint um, Sam Crow as leader of the, um, as the Director of Public Health for uh, Dorset. Um, we've been working really well already with Sam at the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board and with the councils now having the responsibility for public health um, his team are really well embedded I actually spent the uh, best part of the morning up with his team this morning learning a lot more about what they're doing and how they're having a really positive impact um, upon our team and the leadership that he shows of his team is something to be commended so um, I commend this paper and the official appointment of uh, Sam Crow as the new Director of Public Health Thank you, Leader. I understand uh, Councillor Dedman, you wish to second? Yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is an appointment... Oh, shall I just say, I do wish to second it, and I just speak to the appointment. Um, I want to stress, as in the recommendations, that it was a recruitment process that was very, very rigorous, and... Um, Part of the recruitment exercise was creating a three-minute vlog. So I now know what a vlog is. I hope everybody else does. I'm looking over there. But um, so from this rigorous pro process, we appointed um, Sam Crow. The appointment has been to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, which is essential, and um, that's been approved. So we've, we've gone through all those hoops. And I just wanted to say a few words about Sam. Um, for those who don't know much about him. His background is in paleoanthropology, and I, I, uh, I know this is a study of early hominids and physical anthropology, and that can be summarised as a keen interest in the study of fossilised old bones. <laughs> and I just hope there is no link to the position that he is now going to hold. So, um, but seriously, since I've known Sam, I've found him to be really, really enthusiastic about the differences we can make. And he's a person with a real compassionate desire to improve life for our residents. And he's got a good understanding of the differences between our boundaries and obviously of the county boundaries and a keen sense of the value of this partnership working, which is all going so well. So um, I'm sure we all welcome Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dedman. Any debate, members? 
Councillor Drew. Miller, sorry. Thank, thank you. <laughs> call call me what you like, Chair. Thank, thank you very much. I've been called a lot worse. Um, can I just briefly, as a previous uh, portfolio holder for public health in, in Paul, I'd just really like to um, commend this appointment. Uh, Sam, uh, Sam Crow has been an excellent person to, to work with. I'm sure he'll step up and, and lead, lead his team well. And, and just to briefly, you know, sound the drum for, for, for the role Sam's undertaking, you know, pu public health is increasingly an, an important thing we need to be, you know, taking in and prioritising. And, and I firmly believe that, that Sam will do that very well for us. So uh, I commend um, uh, the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I wanted to add my congratulations to Sam on this appointment. Um, having been the uh, Bournemouth Public Health um, Portfolio Holder for the last few years and worked with Sam, I absolutely know about his passion and commitment, his huge knowledge of the subject as well, and I know that he's going to make an excellent uh, Public Health um, Director for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no further speakers... Um We'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Uh, thank you. Those against? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. <laughs> Members, I'd like to now move on to the uh, urgent items that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, first of all, I'd like to call on the Chief Executive to report on the proposal of the deferral of the Council meeting on the 17th of December. Thank you, Chairman. I'm hoping that members will have noticed that a general election has been called uh, for the 12th of uh, December. Uh, our next Council meeting is scheduled for the 17th. Uh, in terms of timetabling, that means that the papers have to be published before the general election is held, and uh, we're therefore proposing uh, that the council meeting should be deferred into January, a uh, date to be determined, um, in order to avoid the pre-election period for the publication of papers and uh, potential issues that that might arise right at the end of a, of a general election, pre-election period. Councillors, are you happy to agree the proposal to defer the council meeting and to note the arrangements of other meetings pre and post general election? Okay. Uh, Councillor Lawton. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, thank the Chief Executive for his explanation for cancelling these meetings. And I realise that he's placed in a difficult position. While I have heard your reasons, I disagree with this course of action. Was it felt to be necessary? BBC, BCP Council is now seven months old, and there is much work to do to achieve our aspiration to make this an example of 21st century Council. In 2017, a snappy election was called. I understand that a serving councillor of Borough of Poole stood as a parliamentary candidate then, yet the business of the council was continued at a pace. I also understand that Dorset, Dorset councils are not cancelling any of their meetings between now and the end of this year. It is business as usual. Members, do our residents not matter? Is the business of BCP council not important? Or, to put it another way, are the political aspirations of some of our councillors in this chamber take precedence over the business of this council, the one which we have been elected to represent. It would seem so. I would ask that we all reflect upon this and ask ourselves as councillors of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, where does our primary responsibility lie? To represent our residents on the council and look after their interests or is it to pursue other political aspirations? In the interest of democracy, I ask therefore that this proposal be put to a vote by the Council. Thank you, Councillor Lawton. Councillor Filer. Thank you, Chairman. I didn't actually indicate, but I'm delighted to speak. <laughs> I think my hand must have been waving. Uh, Ch uh, Chairman, 
I completely disagree with this. First of all, it's very short notice. And secondly, all of us in this chamber are elected to represent the people of Bournemouth, not to satisfy... <laughs> and, and Christchurch, I'm for. That's what we're here for. Um, it's a crucial time in the work of this council. It's new. There's a lot of work to be done. We can't put ourselves on hold for a couple of months because an, a general election has been called. I'm completely and utterly against this. I can't see any reason. The council meeting is after the election, a week after the election, so there's no question of us being in Perda when the council meeting comes. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm amazed and shocked that this should even be proposed, especially if other councils are carrying on their work during the, during the election period. Thank you, Councillor Filer. Um, Councillor Rigby, you've indicated to speak. Um, uh, please address the, uh, the Chamber, and, and obviously we need to seek a proposal and seconder if this is to move forward. So, uh, Councillor Rigby, please. Thank you. Um, I'll just keep it very brief. Um, all I'd like to bring up, and I do understand the reasons behind looking to defer this as well, but... In the next full council meeting, we are looking to receive the report on the Climate and Ecological Emergency Plan, and I feel that this is extremely important as this is guiding our future values of BCP Council and what we should be doing. This is more important than politics. There can be no politics on a dead planet, and we should be taking this forward and accepting it as quickly as possible, and I wouldn't be for um, deferring the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Rigby. Um, Councillor Broadhead. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I was um, prepared to second Councillor Lawton's motion, which I think was to not proceed on this basis. Um, I won't add too much more except to say that um, I agree with the previous speakers. I don't think it's appropriate. We've got a lot to do. My concern actually is not so much about the next full council and deferral for a matter of weeks, uh, but more about extra proposals I hear about a cancellation of further other meetings such as um, Cabinet and the Planning Committee. Um, those decisions are not, um, uh, they don't lie with full council, so we can't actually make that decision tonight. Um, but I do think it sends a very clear message that, as Council Lawton has said, uh, democracy in action, we should be business as usual, and I see no reason um, uh, why those meetings can't take place, and I trust that all members here will not use um, unduly the platform to over-politicise the situation. So I, I would be pleased to second the, um, the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. So it has been proposed that it's business as usual and seconded by Councillor Broadhead. Councillor Green. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the point that I wanted to make is one of precedent that actually um, uh, it's certainly in this chamber we've managed perfectly well to carry on with council meetings and with cabinet meetings. And I'm sure many other, I can see um, Councillor Bagwell nodding, that many of our colleagues have done so. We are aware of the restrictions of PERDA. We are aware um, of how um, officers need to um, perform some roles that they wouldn't, that would normally be left to the politicians. But I think between us we can appeal to our own good sense and therefore I think it sends completely the wrong message that we, to our residents that what happens in Westminster will stop decisions being taken locally on their behalf. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Andrews. Thank you, Mr Chairman. A couple of questions plus for the Chief Executive. Um, I believe we don't actually have a meeting due in January anyway, a full council meeting. So de deferring it to January doesn't mean that we're going to have fewer council, full council meetings in this uh, council year. Uh, also, we've got to think about the officers who have got to prepare all the papers for the meetings, uh, uh, for council meeting, and we've got obviously the uh, fact that those particular officers who are going to be all putting all the papers together have got to obviously get the um, uh, polling stations sorted and all the papers um, allocated for that. And I think that needs to be borne in mind by the members that um, we've got officers who have to be working extremely long hours to fulfil the demand, uh, it would appear, for a full council meeting in December. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Councillor Judy Butt. <coughs> After having stood up, Mr Chairman, my point has already been very well put. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dedman. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, I cannot support the amendment because I do support what the Chief Executive has said. Um, I don't think it's a damage to democracy to move a meeting for a couple of weeks. I do know that we have got a lot to do. Nobody is more aware of that than the Cabinet, I'm sure. But I totally agree with the Chief Executive uh, in what he has said, and I would be um, against the amendment and for the motion. Uh, I understand that you need to move that then, Councillor Dedman, and a second, you need a seconder for that. I wasn't, I wasn't moving or seconding. I was saying that I wouldn't support the motion. Thank this you, amendment Edmund. to the motion, rather. Are there any members wishing to speak? Councillor Rice. No? So, it's been proposed that um, uh, the council, business as usual, and that the, the, the next meeting of the full council... Uh, remains on the calendar. It's been proposed and seconded. Can I have a show of hands in support of that motion, please? Right, I've been advised that, that that's carried. Sorry, members, can we have a show of hands again, please? Those against? And abstentions, please. That motion is then carried, and it will be business as usual. Thank you, members. The next item on the uh, urgent list is the adoption of the Boscombe and Pokesdown Neighbourhood Plan. Uh, can I call on Councillor Phipps, please? Thank you, Chairman. I realise you've only uh, just received this this evening as, as an urgent item, um, so I'll just, just um, say a few words on it. Um, you will recall that at September Full Council, we agreed to hold a referendum on the Bosco and Pokestown Neighbourhood Plan, and that was held last week on Thursday the 31st of October. Residents in the Boscombe and Pokestown Neighbourhood area which is made up of two wards, Boscombe East and Pokesdown and Boscombe West, had the opportunity to vote in a referendum which asked the following question. Do you want BCP Council to use the neighbourhood plan for Boscombe and Pokesdown to help it decide planning applications in the area? And the results showed a strong majority in favour. 2006 residents voted yes that's 93.48%, and only 140 voted no, 6.52%. This is an exceptionally positive result for the Boscombe and Pokesdown Neighbourhood Forum, who have worked so hard to prepare this plan and involve the local community. And many thanks to the residents who took the time to come out and vote in this referendum. BCP Council is required by legislation to make or adopt this neighbourhood plan following a positive outcome at the referendum. 
and this will be the first neighbourhood plan to be adopted in the Bournemouth area. There are also two neighbourhood plans already adopted within Pool area. Pool Keys Forum neighbourhood plan adopted in February 2017 and the Broadstone neighbourhood plan adopted in June 2018. Once adopted, this neighbourhood plan will be part of the statutory development plan for the Boscombe and Pokestown neighbourhood area. And the neighbourhood plan has full development plan weight in decision making. This means that any planning applications within the neighbourhood area will need to have regard to the policies within this neighbourhood plan. I would personally like to thank the Boscombe and Pokestown Neighbourhood Forum, the council officers and all those who were involved in this process for all their hard work over several years in getting this neighbourhood plan to adoption. Therefore, I am very pleased to propose the recommendation in the report as set out to adopt the Boscombe and Pokestown Neighbourhood Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phipps. Councillor Allison, please. Um, yes, I'm very happy to second this. It's a fantastic document, which, is, as um, Margaret said, I took um, many, many years to finally get to. Um, I'm very, very pleased with the margin of um, voting in favour, 93%. That's fantastic. Um, and I'd also like to express my um, thanks to the forum, especially the chair, Harry Seacom. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Uh, any members wishing to speak? Councillor Lord. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I welcome this report? Uh, as a previous portfolio holder for housing, I initiated this some two and a half years ago, so it's good to see it come to fruition. I welcome it. I think it's an excellent report. It should help us and help this Council to help the regeneration of that particular area. And it's nice and good to see democracy in action. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Orton. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Chair. Um, as reference was made to Broadstone Neighbourhood Forum, I ought to declare, uh, for transparency's sake, that I am Chair of Broadstone Neighbourhood Forum. And also, as, uh, as that in that position, I would like to say congratulations to uh, all the people who have worked so hard to get this neighbourhood plan into place. Now that we've got three and more on, online, it would look as if we now need to get together as a whole series of forums so that we can work closely together across the whole community. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Uh, Councillor Butt. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm delighted to see the fruition of this particular forum um, as obviously uh, uh, provided for under the Localism Act 2010, which I had some small part with uh, many moons ago in Pool. Delighted also to hear from Councillor Brook. I remember well all the hard work he put in with regard to his forum with his team and also Pool Key Forum. And just to say to the new chairman that you have some real brilliant expertise in the two Pool forums, and I'm sure that they'd be more than happy to lend themselves with regard to best practice, the glitches and bugbears they are going to face, especially with planning issues, as Councillor Dedman has pointed out to us, along the way, and I'm sure they'll be there to help, as I'm sure we all will. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Butt. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I just want to add my uh, comments to uh, Councillor Jones and Councillor Lawton and others, uh, that this, this shows how the community can come together, work hard together for four years, um, and, and really make a, something that, uh, create something which is going to make a difference to that area um, and, and take ownership as well. Boston doesn't have a very good uh, reputation sometimes with its demographic, but this shows that actually there are many people in Boston and Pokestown who care about their community and their environment. So it's, it's a great uh, testament to them and also to, to those residents that, uh, that led it as well because it was a long journey and a lot of work I'm really proud Thank you, you Councillor Kelly. Uh, Vice Chairman. So I think the ranch is uh, one of the 
ward councillors in the uh, wards that are actually affected by the uh, Boscombe and Pokestown neighbourhood plan, I echo what's gone before. I've been at a variety of the committees and the uh, uh, scrutiny and uh, so on and so forth. Um, everywhere that this plan has come under review has been met with huge amounts of praise. It's very, very comprehensive and it's a great victory for the community to turn out with over a 93% percent vote, uh, percentile that says, yes, this is what they want, this is what they need. So I welcome it, and I particularly welcome uh, Councillor Brooks' comments that hopefully now this will be the first one in Bournemouth and will cascade across the BCP Conovatia. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Councillor Brooks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I'm much encouraged by the skill and the expertise that's been developed in neighbourhood plans. Uh, I am chairing a subcommittee for Highcliffe and Walkford, right on the eastern area of uh, our conurbation, where we are setting about a neighbourhood plan. And also in Christchurch, in Christchurch Town, in Hearn, and in Burton, we have all embarked on preparing neighbourhood plans. So we have a journey ahead of us for the next 18 months, two years, but I welcome all the uh, knowledge and skill that's in this room today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brooke, <clears throat> any other speakers at all? In which case it's been proposed and seconded as set out. Um, could I have a show of hands? All those in favour, please. Thank you. Those against? And any abstentions? Thank you, members. Agenda item 12, notice of motions. There are no uh, notice of motions have been received. Moving on then to agenda item 13, questions from councillors. Uh, can I call upon Councillor Andy Jones, please? I've actually asked our portfolio holder for transport to respond on this as he's uh, actively involved with it. Councillor Hadley. That, thank you, Chair. Um, I thank Councillor Jones for his question, which the Leader asked me to respond to, as it's been raised with me um, and with officers by members opposite previously. The introduction of restrictions to suspend parking within King's Park during match days was agreed through the safety advisory group meetings, the football club and the police. With the increasing success of AFC Bournemouth, the police were concerned with access to the site for emergency vehicles and for safer access away from the site for coaches carrying visiting fans. They reported that on occasions, due to the level of parking by blue badge holders within Kings Park, coaches were prevented from leaving the site in a safe manner at the end of the match. The restrictions have been introduced using a temporary traffic regulation order also in place in Thistle Thistlebarrow Road on match days. We did not enforce the restrictions for the first few matches and most people have been respecting the change. Following feedback from blue badge holders and in order to mitigate the impact, the club have offered them alternative parking. Members of the safety advisory group recently met with the lo local councillors, including yourself and blue badge holders representing the vans to review the decision. As you will know, it was reported that changes have been made have had a very positive impact, not only for the safety of coaches leaving the grounds, but also all vehicles departing after the match. There was, there was discussion on the appropriate provision of parking for blue badge holders and a commitment from the club to make some changes and to ensure this is monitored over the next few home fixtures with a review in the new year. I would hope that having attended this meeting that Councillor Jones is content with the approach taken by the Council in partnership with AFC Bournemouth and guidance from the police. You will also know that I've been raising the possibility of direct, better direct walking links between Pokes down for Boscombe Railway Station and Kings Park to help reduce match day congestion. We will continue to work with the police, the club and the fans, including those with disability, to attempt to ensure that everyone has a safe and enjoyable experience. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Councillor Jones, did you have a supplementary at all?
Thank you for supplementary. Um, equality impact assessments are undertaken through, through um, um, all the major changes, and I would expect that that would be the case. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. The next question, members, is a question from Councillor Drew Miller. But thank you very much, uh, Chair. My, my question is in relation to uh, the Bournemouth Marathon Festival. The uh, marathons are very much on vogue at the moment in terms of you know, the, the first person just broken sub, sub t two hours. Um, and actually, before my, my, I go into my question, I'd just like to wish our, our leader luck as she um, starts her training for the, the London Marathon Festival. So uh, good, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so in, term, in terms of the question, could the portfolio holder please outline what contractual arrangements have been historically in place with the organisers of the Bournemouth Marathon Festival and our legacy councils and whether those contractual provisions have changed for what would have been the 2020 Bournemouth Marathon Festival? In particular, was there and is there a requirement on the organisers to provide a full marathon as part of the festival? In addition, what were the number of entrants to the festival as a whole and the marathon specifically in each year since its inception? Councillor Allison. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, the marathon festival was retended in 2018 on a six-year contract from 2019 to 2024, and GSI events were the only submission. The organisers are within their contractual rights to drop the marathon distance from the weekend of events. Either party can opt out of the contract, but given that the inaugural event took over 18 months to organise, the 2020 races have already been agreed without the marathon distance. From 2020 and onwards, the half marathon distance gives the organisers the flexibility to make adjustments to the route that will make it easier and more attractive for runners and also more, uh, far less impactful on the local residents. Over the past seven years, this has been one of the main issues where runners have had to move through residential areas in order to gain the required distance for the full marathon. Um, the decision by the organisers, GSI events, not to have the marathon is partly due to the fact that they wanted a guarantee of the same route being available every year, which due to development works, road changes and unknowns like cliff slips, the council is not able to provide. Um, the organisers have complete confidence that Run Bournemouth will continue to attract runners to the area and elongate the uh, tourist season, being a benefit to the many hotels, accommodation providers and other leisure providers. Uh, the overall event has grown from 5,975 entrants in 2013 to 10,646 in 2019. In 2013, the marathon entries accounted for 35% of all entries, and by 2009, this was down to 20%. The marathon distance accounts for just over 2,000 entries. It perhaps is helpful to add to this information that the entries across the board for Run Bournemouth are 10% up on numbers from this time last year. 63% of the runners in 2020 events are visitors to the area and are not local. Um, and this is very positive given that the organisers are only in their fifth week of entries being open and haven't yet released most of their marketing campaigns for the event. Um, the council will continually explore trends and test the market longer term for a marathon going forwards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Councillor Mayor, did you have a supplementary? I, I, I do, actually. Um, you know, I... I've, I've, uh, I've taken part in, in, in that marathon, in, in the actual marathon distance in, in Bournemouth twice, and it's, it's a fantastic course. It's one of the most iconic um, uh, events in the country. And in fact, you can actually run, run along the sea, you know, the, the seafront, up and down, up and down two piers. Um, I find your answer slightly contradictory because you're, you're on one hand saying how positive an event it is, but then also saying, and I think, I think I'm quoting rightly, uh, the council agreed, you know, it was agreed, um, and uh, council not able to. You know, we, we, we as members are running or, or should be running, running this council. So if it has been agreed with the organisers not to run this festival, then, then you know, that, that's from, from my take on, on your watch. Um, so in, ter in terms of a supplementary question, would you agree with me that losing the marathon is, 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 is bad for Bournemouth, something that's happened on your watch? And is it something you would look to intervene in for, for, for future years? Because... If this organiser doesn't want to go and run an organiser marathon, other organisers can do. And you know, we should, we, I think we should have that ambition. This is either a, you know a, a lack of ambition on our part, or it's a or it's a lazy administration, one way or the other. So yeah, I've asked a, about 17 questions. I apologise. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry. I'm happy to clarify. So. Um, it wasn't a joint decision between the event organiser and the council. It was a decision made by the organiser, and the council was informed. Um, sorry, there's a lot of questions there. Sorry. I'm not allowed to speak. <laughs> um, I, you know, I really do sympathise. I understand that people are very supportive of having a marathon in the, in the town. Um, however, GSI were the only people who um, ap applied for the tender the first time round. 
you know, we could go out and tender again for, for a second time, but there's no guarantee that there will be anybody else that will organise uh, the organise. Thank you, Councillor Allison. The next question, members, is from Councillor Anne Filer regarding the Wessex Fields. Councillor Filer, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, would the portfolio holder explain the reasoning behind the decision to construct the road to nowhere behind Wessex Fields? Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thank Councillor Filer for her question. The Cabinet had carefully considered the road onto and through the Wessex Fields site that the previous Bournemouth Borough Council took through planning and the shortfall of funding that they had secured to finish their scheme. Reviewing the travel plan that was within the application documents, it was plain that the majority, 87% of people travelling to site, are expected to be coming from the urban conurbation. And despite being one of the widest roads in the, in the area, Castle Lane East is already chronically busy. It has repeatedly been proven around the world that new roads induce further traffic. We plan to consult with the public about how we can ensure the Wessex Fields site delivers social as well as economic benefit. We don't want to build a road through the site at this stage, which may constrain the potential buildings or load it up with traffic from Castle Lane East before there are significantly enhanced sustainable transport options in place for the whole Little Down area. We have had good discussions recently with the Royal Bournemouth Hospital and the University to just understand their plans, and in particular how we can work together on measures to encourage travel to site by bus, by walking and cycling, as these are far more cost-effective and healthy ways to reduce congestion in the area. We must plan to move people, not just cars, and to encourage travel choices that are less damaging to the built and natural environment, not just at Wessex Fields, but across the conurbation. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Councillor Farley, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I, th I thank you for your uh, answer, Councillor Hadley, and um, I couldn't agree more that we must encourage people to travel other ways than, other by, uh, than by car. But unfortunately, people who are going to hos hos hospital, either as visitors or as patients, don't, don't have that, uh, and, and as staff working in the hospitals who work shifts, um, I, I, I'm sure you will agree with me, I'm asking, do you agree with me, that it's going to be well nigh impossible for staff, six o'clock in the morning shifts, for patients having to attend who can't walk, how are they going to get to the hospital? I, I, I think we should be supporting our hospitals, not requiring them to pay for a road behind to access their, their land. Um, and have you listened to the many deputations who've been to this, not today, but in previous councils? How many other deputations have we had from concerned residents right across the conurbation and beyond that when Poole and Bournemouth Hospital merge, the congestion on Castle Lane is going to become impossible and gridlock will be a real problem for many? Um, have you listened to them? Are you taking any notice of it? Or is this just a green ambition very, very good ambition, which is totally impractical in a hospital setting. Thank you, Councillor Foyler. Councillor Hadley. Thank you. Um, yes, well, as, as I said, we have already been talking to the hospital, and, and one of the things that, that uh, they, they've been talking to us about is, is um, looking at the university and how they've dealt with the traffic problems at, at the Talbot campus, and particularly with that in, in looking at bus, bus routes and how they can support a bus network to in, encourage people to leave the car at home. And, and you know, we, we will not build our way out of this by building more roads, uh, um, and, and we have to find uh, and support uh, more sustainable options to get people to, to places particularly on staff. Um, as the two hospitals change, there will be more staff uh, um, uh, um, supporting um, critical care uh, um, who will be arriving out, out of, off, off the rush hour period. Um, but the staff do have the opportunity to, 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 to mode shift uh, and the hospital are very keen to make that happen, uh, as are the university. So we are working very actively with those partners. We don't expect everyone to get in a car. We just expect to be able to move enough people that actually there's space for those people who do need to use motorised transport to get about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. The next question is from Councillor Dwayne Farr. Councillor Farr. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, since the May elections, the community infrastructure levy neighbourhood portion has been stopped. Local community groups have approached ward colleagues and myself 
We've had to turn them away for projects including a public access life-saving defibrillator. Defibrillators save vital minutes before an ambulance can arrive on the scene, increasing chance of survival from a heart attack. Why has this service been stopped since the May elections while others have continued? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Councillor Mrs Phipps. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, I can reassure councillors that the application process for bidding for the neighbourhood portion of the community infrastructure levy, the SIL, has not been stopped. If members and community groups have submitted bids to officers and have been told that the scheme has been suspended or stopped or closed, then please can you notify me because that is incorrect. Leading up to May 2019 elections, there was a pause on determining outstanding bids uh, that had been submitted due to the PERDA. Since the formation of the new council, offices in discussion with the portfolio holder have been reviewing the process for allocating neighbourhood portion SIL funds, and it is anticipated that a Cabinet report will be forthcoming, possibly in December or at the latest in January, to look afresh at the various approaches across BCP Council that have been inherited from the legacy authorities, the aim being to have a consistent approach to allocating SIL neighbourhood portion funds across the whole of BCP Council. However, in the meantime, the existing systems in place will continue until a new BCP-wide approach is adopted. And officers are, or, imminently, they are writing to all councillors to remind them of the processes in place and to confirm that new bids are welcome. In Bournemouth, further SIL neighbourhood portion panel meetings will be established to consider any additional bids that councillors may want to put forward, including should it be forthcoming for a defibr defibrillator in the Kinson Ward. In respect of proposed outstanding SIL neighbourhood portion bids, officers previously wrote to all Bournemouth councillors requesting they reconfirm their commitment to outstanding applications and to inform them that these applications will be considered by the reconvened SIL neighbourhood portion panel at a meeting on the 21st of November. And the majority of councillors have confirmed that they do want the bids to be considered at this panel meeting. In Paul, the current approach of considering bids from the community for projects from the overall SIL neighbourhood pot is still in place. There is expected to be sufficient money in the Paul neighbourhood portion pot to run another bidding round in early 2020, which will be confirmed and publicised very shortly in a communication, as I mentioned, to all councillors. In Christchurch, there is total coverage of the area by parish, town and neighbourhood councils and therefore in accordance with regulations the neighbourhood portion will be passed to these bodies to be spent on local projects. It is the intention for the legacy pre-April 2019 15% neighbourhood proportion in the previously unparished areas of Christchurch to be passed on to the new councils which is Christchurch Town Council and Highcliffe and Walkford Parish Council. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Councillor Phipps. Councillor Farr, did you have a supplementary at all? Yes, uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for uh, your in-depth answer, much appreciated. Uh, well, just, just looking through the, uh, uh, the information about the, the neighbourhood plan for uh, Boscombe and um, uh, Pope's down there, so I'm, I'm quite a fan of referendum, so I'm pleased to see that that one has um, been, been accepted and gone through no, any dispute over, over that. Um, so that's great news. Uh, I see that uh, part of that announcement says that the, the still neighbourhood portion rises from 15% to 25%. When will that come about? As far as I'm aware, if, if you have, um, if an area like that, that Boscombe and Pokestown now, as it's been adopted, has a neighbourhood plan, then the portion of the SIL portion goes up from 15 to 25%, and that would then come about 
when there is another a development that attracts seal in that area, in the Boscombe Pokestown area, which you're referring to. Thank you, Councillor Fitt. Members, the final question this evening is from Councillor Andy Jones. Councillor Jones, please. Thank you, Chairman. There have been a significant number of occasions when certain Cabinet members have not responded or even acknowledged emails from myself and colleagues on behalf of residents, some dating back to June. What measures will the leader now put in place to address this totally unacceptable situation, and how will she ensure that this does not continue to happen in the future? Leader. Thank you, Councillor Jones, for your question. I note that I had already received this question from you several weeks ago and responded to it within 24 hours, copying in your group leader to express my own disappointment that some people had fallen short of their expectations. This must have been blind copy to others as I then received an onward email from another member of your group which I duly responded to and received confirmation from them that they were content with the reply I had received from them. As promised in my email, I've raised this individually with the Cabinet members in question uh, that were named by you and others and with their respective group leaders. They have assured me that they have taken steps to improve their administrative duties. It has been a period of great change for councillors and officers and the working relationships that some officers are developing with their Cabinet members is quite different from those under previous councils. Some members have taken a little longer to establish these relationships and on occasion they have relied more heavily than I would have liked on assuming that officers might respond to some issues. I have reiterated the responsibilities that go with being a Cabinet member and stressed the importance of swift and full replies to queries, whether they are from members of the public, our partners, officers or other councillors. I would like to remind members of the Council that using a portfolio holder for reporting items such as fly tipping or one-off notification of damaged toilets is not a good use of anyone's time and I would encourage members to use the reporting functions that are set up for this purpose. For general queries, we now have a member services email that can help direct councillors to the correct officer for simple responses. I can assure you that all members of the Cabinet are fully aware of their responsibilities and the expectations on them to show leadership. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Jones, did you have a supplementary? Thank you. Right, Members, there being no further business to conduct, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs>